Hello, and welcome back to Trumpet's Call. I pray that you're blessed today. Thank you for once again clicking on that button and coming and joining us again for another lesson. Today, we will be studying a little bit of, actually the full chapter of Matthew chapter 5. I was actually reading in Deuteronomy, and Deuteronomy led me to Matthew, so it's a really roundabout way, but I'll get into more detail about how Deuteronomy led me to Matthew uh, as we get into the lesson. But uh, So let's get started. Here we're going to be reading the words of our Master, of our Mashiach, of our Savior. So we're really excited about that. So let's get started in Matthew chapter 5. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. I love how, in the second verse, how it says, and he opened his mouth and taught them. As if, as soon as his mouth was open, there was a gift of words, there was a gift of anointing, there was a gift of correction, instruction, waiting for those who were in need. I, I love that. And I love how it says that when he saw the multitudes, he went into the mountain for the express purpose of being able to teach them. I love that too. But it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. And so what does that mean? What does it mean to be poor in spirit? It, it To me, it means somebody who has very little uh, understanding of spiritual things or understanding of the Father or of Messiah. But there has to be this desire, this interest for more. You have very little and you're wanting and, and yearning for more, but you recognize your own spiritual paucity, your own spiritual poverty. And the most high the most high saying here through Messiah, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. That kingdom of heaven that's coming to earth will be filled with people who are poor in spirit, who recognize their need for the Messiah who recognize their need for his words of wisdom, who recognize their need for his salvation. And blessed are they that mourn. The kingdom is going to be filled with people who are mourning, people who've been sad, people who have been mistreated, people who have been abused. This reminds me of, I was reading in Numbers, I can't remember the, I can't remember the, the chapter number, but I was reading, it wasn't Numbers, it was Samuel. I was reading in Samuel, I was reading where David was running from Saul. Saul was the king at the time, as you remember, and he, for whatever reason, hated David because actually because David was going to replace him and he recognized the anointing on David's life. And in seeking after him, seeking to destroy him, David ran and hid in a cave of Adullam. And in the cave, he could just, couldn't, just drew to himself so many men who were discontent, who were in debt, people who life had treated wrongly, who had gotten a fair, who hadn't gotten a fair deal in their estimation, or people who had gotten in trouble. Maybe they had made bad decisions or made mistakes, and these are the people who were drawn to David in that cave, and they became his loyal uh, soldiers. They became a part of his army, you know eventually I believe it got up to 600 of them but in the scripture I was reading there were 400 men three to 400 men and they were loyal to David and these are the ones who had a need and David perhaps recognized that need because he had a need he was in trouble and he was on the run and so were they and they were able to give comfort to each other so the people who are who are on the run spiritually, the people who are mourn, the people who are sad for the decisions they've made, for the situations and circumstances in life. These are the people whom the Most High is calling. Come into the kingdom. Come. There's a place for you here. 
verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see Yah. For they shall see Yah. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of Yah. So we go back up to verse 5, the meek. The meek inherit the earth. Those who don't, who aren't high-minded, who don't think so highly of themselves, who are fair in their estimation of themselves, like Messiah, who knew that the power of the Most High was running and flowing through him, but he didn't boast or vaunt himself up. He wasn't prideful. They just inherit the earth. And those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, perhaps you have those who are poor in spirit, who then hunger and thirst after righteousness, and they will be filled. The Most High will not allow any to hunger and thirst after righteousness, after right standing in His sight, and not fill them. He blesses the merciful because they obtain mercy. So when you're merciful, you get mercy. You sow mercy, you reap mercy. You don't sow mercy, you don't reap mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see Yahuwah. Wow. The pure in heart. Those who, like I said, they have no guile. This this reminds me of Revelation chapter 14, where it talks about the 144,000 standing on the mountaintop with Messiah. And it said, they had no guile. And this is what I'm reminded of when I when I read the pure in heart. There's nothing in them that's false. There's nothing in them that seeks to deceive or seeks to make someone think something that's not so. In any way, they're, they're harmless as doves, so to speak. They don't seek to hurt anyone in any way. They're guileless, pure in heart. They shall see the Most High Yah. These are the ones who become the sons and daughters of the Most High Yah. And perhaps they serve in His temple where they never leave. These are just some thoughts that I had reading that. Blessed are the peacemakers. Those who seek peace, those who make peace, they'll be called the children of the Most High Yah. This is a tough list to live, live up to. If you think about all of these things, these are all the things that Messiah is mentioning that Israel was supposed to be. Being a light unto the Gentiles, all of these things are the things that we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be poor in spirit. We're supposed to mourn for righteousness. We're supposed to hunger and thirst after righteousness. We're supposed to be meek. We're supposed to be pure in heart, guileless. We're supposed to be merciful. We're supposed to be peacemakers. We're supposed to be the children of the Most High Yah. And we haven't always done that. But in the regeneration, in the restitution of all things, the Most High will make all things new. And He will make us what we couldn't be in the past. Verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. The Most High is telling us here through Messiah that there's a blessing that comes for being persecuted, but not the persecution that comes as judgment for sin. But the fact of being persecuted for being righteous, say for instance, being the, the Most High's chosen people, and let's say, for instance, you've been banished from his presence for 400 years in a land that's not your own. And let's say, for instance, you come to yourself, just like it says in the apocryphal books, I believe the book of Baruch. And let's say you come to yourself in the land of your, your captivity and you remember yourself and you begin to turn to the Most High and worship him and praise him and pray and fast and turn from your, from your wicked ways and do the things that are pleasing in his sight and keep his Torah. And then all of a sudden, all of this persecution comes on you. People start mistreating you. All of a sudden, there's a, there's a worldwide pandemic and all this stuff starts coming against you. 
This is persecution for righteousness sake. There's a blessing for that. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But when, and then they revile you, they persecute you. They say all manner of evil against you. You're not the people. You couldn't be the people. The most high's people's in that other land. It, you couldn't be you. And the most high wouldn't choose a ragtag group of people like you. Oh, but he would. And he did. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so he's telling us, rejoice, be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. The Most High is saying, don't worry about them. Don't worry about those who don't believe. Even of your own people who don't want to believe their true identity, don't worry about them. I'll take care of them. Great is your reward. You just do what's right. You do what's right, and I'll take care of your enemies. It says, for so persecuted they, the prophets, which were for you. We think about all the prophets and all that they went through for righteousness sake. And if they could bear up under the pressure, we can bear up under the pressure that we're under. The Most High will see to it that we're absolved. He'll make sure that we're protected and kept safe and that we're gathered back into our homeland. Verse 13. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt hath lost his savor, where will shall it be salted? It is in thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. We are the salt of the earth, and we are the candle put on a candlestick, on a menorah. We are the salt of the earth, and the salt unfortunately lost its savor. And the only way for salt that's lost its savor to be resalted, let's say, for instance, you've got a, a mound or a rock of salt, and that salt so got soaked in water, and the outside of the salt was no longer salty. It, it had lost its savor. It was good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. So if you take that block of salt and you cast it out and you allow men to trod on it, to persecute it, to treat it badly, to walk all over it and make it a slave, then what you do is you take that hardened rock salt and break it up into pieces. It's humbled. It's broken. It's broken into pieces. And the salt that was on the inside of that hardened rock begins to come out. And so it regains its saltiness. That's what happened to our people. We, like a hardened stone, a hardened stone of salt, had to be cast out and trodden under the feet of the Gentiles to regain our salty savor. Light set on a candlestick, like a city on a hill, which cannot be hid. Our light was hid for a season, but in the regeneration, it will no longer be hid. We will be that menorah, that light, that shining city that the Most High intended, and the Gentiles will come to the light of Messiah that shines brightly in and through us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Think not that I came to destroy the law, the Torah, or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the Torah till all be fulfilled. There's a lot of debate, you know, in Christianity about whether or not the law has been done away with, but these are words right from the Messiah's mouth. Think not, not for a second, not for a minute, not for a millisecond. Think that I've come to, f to destroy the law. I have not come to destroy or abolish the law or to set it aside, but I've come to fulfill it. So how would it look if someone set out a territory on, in a new region? So earth, the earthly realm is a territory of the kingdom of heaven. And so the rules and laws that were established when this territory was ordained suddenly, somehow, are no longer in effect? We're just lawless now? Suddenly we've got a, a kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, which is on earth, that has no laws, no rules, you just do whatever you want? No, there are laws and there are rules. What's been done away with is that ceremonial requirement to kill bulls and goats, because the Most High has taken care of that in Messiah. He is our, he is our eternal lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. 
from the foundation of the world. And so we have no need to go and kill anything in order to have our sins covered. Messiah's blood has covered that. But keeping his commandments and keeping his Torah, these these commandments are the very nature of the Father. And so when we do them, we are being perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. So I don't, I mean, when I was in Christianity, I, I, I believed this and I I always question this verse, though whenever I'd read Matthew chapter 5 and I'd come to this verse, these sets of verses, I would say, but how? I never got the answer to my question until I came into the identity uh, of my true identity and understood what the, why that we went into captivity. Because we weren't keeping Torah. Because we weren't keeping Torah. We still had to experience the consequences of our sin. Because there was a requirement on this nation to keep the laws of the land. And we didn't do it. And so that judgment fell on that generation and subsequent generations. So he is saying that the law is not done away with, period. It's not. So we glorify our Father when we do good works. How do we do good works? Keep Torah. If you keep Torah, you'll be doing plenty of good works. The more I learn about it, the more wonderful and life-giving it is. I, I love it. I love the Most High's Word. Verse 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least com- one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I shall for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. So these are the verse of scriptures right here that led me from Deuteronomy, uh, where I was reading, listening, in Deuteronomy to, to Matthew. Because it was talking about an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life, blood for blood. And I was reading that, and so I was looking to see, well, what does Messiah say about that? I believe he addressed that in Matthew chapter 5. So let me go and see that. So as I was reading about that, I saw this, and I said, Hmm, least commandments. You mean there are least commandments and great commandments? So I started to look more into this. And then these who break the least commandments and teach others to do so, they're still going to enter the kingdom of heaven. They'll be least in the kingdom, but they'll still enter. And he's saying that if you teach men to do these least commandments, you'll be great in the kingdom of heaven. So you can see that there are there's a hierarchy here. There are those who are going to be least in the kingdom and those who are going to be great in the kingdom. There are those who are going to inherit eternal life, and there are those who are going to inherit long life. So I did a little research, and I found this chart uh, from the Landover Baptist Church. And this is this perfectly lays out what I was seeing as I was looking at the commandments. So you can see that there's a level of severity that goes from the higher the commandments that come first on the list. And as it goes down on the list, the severity or the punishments associated with breaking these commandments, it gets less and less. So the first commandment, this is the first and most important commandment. Thou shall have no other Elohims before me, period. The most severe. Breaking this commandment brings complete and utter genocide. The the Most High will wipe out your entire nation for breaking this commandment. And when the children of Israel went into Canaan, They had been, of course, not keeping this commandment, not that I'm saying that it's a commandment for them, but to worship another deity, no matter who you are, is to not worship the true true deity. So the judgment or the wrath of the Most High abides on you. So the Most High told the children of Israel, I'm not giving you this land of Canaan because you're righteous. I'm giving it to you because I'm bringing judgment on the inhabitants of this land. They've been wicked, and so I'm judging them by giving you their land. But don't think for a second that I'm giving you their land because you somehow have attained a greater level of righteousness, because you haven't. So that's the most important commandment. The second important commandment that brings a severe judgment, making graven images, making an image of anything in heaven or on earth of a false deity or even of, of the Father, of the Son. He's, no, you get wiped out for that. Your entire uh, entire nation, your men, your women, your children, everything must be killed. Everything. And you see the corresponding scriptures here that associate. You can see where these judgments were enacted in the lives of the people 
listed in the verses above. So in the third commandment, you're not to take the name of Yahuwah in vain. It, it's a high, it's not listed under severe, it's listed under high. It still brings death. But instead of the death to the entire community or the entire nation, it brings death to you as an individual. And you can see the scriptures associated with that, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, and Mark. The fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That comes with a high uh, alert level or high punishment level. It leads to death. You're, you're stoned to death if you break commandment, um, fourth commandment. Honor your father and your mother. This is a commandment that comes with a promise so that you will have long life. You disrespect your mother and your father, according to Torah, you get stoned to death by the community. They, they don't tolerate that. Okay, and so he had the seventh commandment, but I'm just going to go ahead and put the sixth commandment. The sixth commandment, he has elevated. I say it could also be high, but maybe not as high as the seventh. So I understand why he made that change. With the sixth commandment, you shall do no murder. It's an elevated uh, judgment because you you die in certain cases depending on the motive of your heart. So depending on your motive for killing, it still leads, it's still a capital punishment that leads to death. But if you killed accidentally, then there's mercy. You go before the judges and then there's mercy for you. So it still has capital punishment as a punishment. But I understand why he made that change. So the seventh commandment, you shall commit not commit adultery. You commit adultery, you get stoned, you die. So once again, a severe punishment or a high level of punishment for breaking the seventh commandment. The eighth commandment, you should not steal. This commandment leads to fines, like you have to pay, you have to pay back five or seven times more than you stole, or you get taken into slavery, or uh, a capital punishment depending on what you've done. If if you're caught in the act of stealing, then then you're executed. If you're caught stealing, you're still punished, but it's not as severe as the others. And the ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You don't make a, a legal binding statement against your neighbor that you know was is false. The judgment for this is you, you're despised and you're scorned by the community. But there is no capital punishment that I can see associated with this. And then don't covet. Don't cover your, your neighbor, your neighbor's wife, his, his donkey, his wife. Nothing that belongs to your neighbor should you covet. And the judgment for this is you're despised and you're scorned by the by the community, by the community of Yasharal. Maybe you're ostracized and put off to the side for a little bit. But the, the bottom line is that there are levels in the commandments where there are certain commandments you break immediately. You or the, maybe the whole community dies. And when I saw this today, it just blew my mind because I never really realized what Messiah was saying when he was talking about being least in the kingdom or being great in the kingdom or breaking one of the least commandments. I never saw that before. So I'm so grateful to the Most High for showing this to me today. So it goes on to say that except your righteousness is exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees who say or teach and do not, you will in no wise even enter. He's saying the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, they teach you what you're to do. They teach you Torah, but they say and they do not. They have no righteousness based on their obedience to do what the Most High is saying because they say and do not. So you can't be one who says and do and does not. And that's what they're teaching in Christianity. They're saying, say the commandments, read them, study them, but you don't have to do them. Unless your righteousness exceeds those of the scribes and the Pharisees and those who say that the law has been done away with, you will in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. These are the Most High's words as I understand them through our Messiah. And the Most High has given us certain standards to keep and these commandments in dictate to us and indicate to us his very character, his very nature. Verse 21. Ye have heard that it was said of them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, 
shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say unto his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But who, but whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. This is another one of those verses that as I approached it, it gave me pause and I had to ask the father, ask, ask the father what, what it was that I was supposed to think about this. And so once again, it took me back to Torah and I wanted to check to see what the stipulations were for those who had committed murder. So according to Torah, if you kill someone or commit someone, you have the right to flee to one of the sanctuary cities, the cities of refuge at the most, at the most I had Moses to have the people to build. So there are several cities of refuge. So if someone commits a murder, then they're able to go to that place to find a place of safety so that they can protect themselves from the avenging family who would be then looking for them to make vengeance for that family member who had been killed. And so once the person who had committed the murder found themselves at the sanctuary city, one of the judges, or one of the Levites had to then make a determination as to this person's guilt. And if it was determined that this person had a premeditated motive for committing the murder, then they were sent back to the original city and then the family of the the family of the person who had been killed would then have the right to um, take vengeance on this person. But if it was found that this the, the murder or the killing was an accident, then the person was allowed to stay in the city of refuge until the high priest died. And after the high priest died, then the person could then return to their to their city and live out their lives. So staying in the city of refuge protected them from the vengeance of the family members because it was a safe a place of safety, a place of protection. Very much like our Messiah. He is our city of refuge, our place of safety. So I found this really interesting article by Pamela Barmush, Barmash. And I'll read some of it here. It says, Homicide, the unlawful killing of a human being is among the most heinous offenses if not the most heinous offense in human society. The ancient Israelites and other peoples in the near, in the ancient Near East sought to promote justice after killing by identifying and punishing the perpetrator. Not all homicides were unlawful. In fact, some were justified. A person might have been authorized to kill members of an enemy force or a person who had committed a serious crime. The circumstances of a homicide determined whether it was unlawful. The Decalogue, or the Ten Commandments, includes a law against unlawful killing. The famous King James translation of the Bible incorrectly uses the term kill rather than murder in its translation. According to the Bible, the family of the victim had the responsibility for ensuring that the slayer was held accountable for the death. One member of the family, called the Blood Redeemer or the Blood Avenger, had the right and responsibility to kill the slayer on sight with impunity. And this is um, found in Exodus 21, Numbers 35, and Deuteronomy 19. This institution, the blood feud, should not be understood as the kind of feud portrayed in Hollywood movies. Only the slayer was in danger, not his family or his associates. And only one member of the victim's family served as the blood avenger. If a slayer could flee to a town designated as a refuge, the blood avenger's right to kill him was put on hold. Other people then conducted a trial to determine whether the slayer had killed intentionally or accidentally, according to Deuteronomy 19. The elders of the killer's hometown conducted the trial, but according to Numbers 35, the killer stood trial before a pan-Israelite assembly. If it was determined that the slayer had killed intentionally, he was handed over to the blood avenger for execution. But if the slayer was judged to have killed accidentally, he could stay in the place of safety. The Bible assumes a male killer in these laws. It is unclear whether the same process would apply to a female killer. Okay, so what we have here is the understanding that once you have been have been committed of or 
once you have committed the crime of murder or killing, you go before the judges. And this is what Messiah is referring to here, that you would go before the, the judges. But he's also uh, uh, saying that to be angry with your brother without a cause is akin to murder. He's equating the murder of someone in your heart by having negative feelings toward them with the actual physical carrying out of a physical murder, just like he create, equated adultery with physical lust. To have physical lust is to commit adultery in your heart. To hate your brother is to commit murder in your heart. So once again, here's an example of the father looking at the heart and not necessarily the outward actions. He's looking at the outward actions, but he looks at the heart first. And so it shows you that the crime or the sin is committed in the heart first. Every man sins when he's drawn away by his own lust. And lust, when it hath been conceived, brings forth death. So brings forth sin, and sin, then death. So the Most High is looking at the heart. So, but there was something interesting in the article that I read that really kind of piqued my interest and got me, I guess, a little bit excited when I saw it. This, this, uh, this responsibility that's been given to the blood avenger or the blood redeemer. Now we all know that Messiah is our kinsman redeemer, but according to the reading of this, something just jumped in my spirit and I really feel in my heart that Messiah is also our blood redeemer and our blood avenger. When Messiah comes, he will judge the nations. He is the ultimate judge. He will judge the nations, and as our representative, he will have them answer for the ways in which they have treated his people, for all of the murders that they've committed. He will have them to stand before him and answer for those things. And if the answer that he receives is not satisfactory, then he issues his judgment. He commits the ultimate act of blood avenging his beloved his people. He chastises the people. He speaks to them from Torah. That's the fire that comes out of his mouth and the sword that comes out of his mouth. He condemns his enemies with Torah. So when he speaks Torah and the condemnation is falls on his enemies, on our enemies, and once they're found guilty of having broken his law, having mistreated his people, having, having murdered his people, he takes out vengeance. And that is what Armageddon is about. It's the blood avenging of the Most High regarding his people and the way his people have been treated. It's the, it's the supper, the great supper of the Most High, where the animals, the birds are invited to come, partake of the blood and flesh of captains and of military men and of mighty men. It's a great avenging act. And that's what I'm seeing here. And it's, and I... The more you learn about the scriptures, the more you see that the New and Old Testament, there's such synergy between the two when you understand the Old. And Messiah certainly is our kinsman redeemer, but he's also our blood avenger and our blood redeemer. So I was shooting for 48, but we'll have to finish up uh, those other verses another time. So they'll have to be a part two. But I thank you for once again joining me on the channel. I'm, I'm Maria. And I appreciate your support and I appreciate your coming and watching. And if you haven't done so, appreciate you subscribing and perhaps sharing the videos if that is something that you feel inclined to do. But either way, I thank you for being here. I thank you for watching. And I pray that the Most High bless and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. And I just pray that our blood avenger our, our blood redeemer comes soon and avenges his people for all of the mistreatment over the centuries. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness to the children of men. Shalom, brothers and sisters. Shalom.